Kia ora, talofa, namaste, haere mai, and welcome to this week's episode of the Niche Cash Variety Show. We are from the Niche Cache, the niche-cache.com. We love Aotearoa sport, we love Aotearoa, and we are grateful for the beautiful land, oceans, and trees, and birds, and animals that are share Aotearoa with us and we are grateful to be here on another beautiful overcasty probably going to rain this afternoon type of day in Aotearoa big up Aotearoa sport big up Aotearoa well okay, just sliding on the back of that Patreon podcast I am curious I was pondering who do you think will get the next victory over Australia for New Zealand national teams excluding the All Blacks who Let's be honest, they defeat Australia quite frequently. I'm thinking about all whites. I'm thinking about Aotearoa Kiwis. I'm thinking about black caps. You can extend it out, but I am curious. There's a, like it is a, uh, what's the word? A loaded question with all sorts of variables and, and wrinkles. But off the top of your head, who is the next Aotearoa team to get a victory over Australia in our major sports? Well, the Black Caps missed their chance, didn't they? So, don't they think they might get them. a uh, T20 World Cup victory. They might. They might not either. In Australian soil, it's generally not been a, a happy hunting ground. Um, I mean, I'm on record as saying the All Whites are going to beat Australia in at least one of these two games. So, I said so on this very same variety show a couple of weeks ago. I'm saying so again now. Um, however, the All Blacks do play them beforehand. So, we do have to exclude the All Blacks because. They're on Saturday, all whites on Sunday. Um, big weekend of sport in, in Tamaki Makoto, actually. I, I might go down myself, although I won't be watching the All Blacks. I'll be watching uh, Women's National League football games and might see if I can get down to the All Whites as well. But I think the All Whites can win that. It's the, and I, therefore, I think I have to, I have to put like, chips on the table and, and that count there. Yeah. I'm going to twist this around and say with All Whites will get a win, then Kiwis win the World Cup with a victory over Australia at some point as well. How about that? Uh, I don't I'll, trade, them... I'll trade that outcome for a 3-0 series loss and the ODIs for the Black Caps against yeah, Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I'm can... happy with that trade-off. Sacrificial series. Yeah. <laughs> um, that ODI. It's a bit of bloodletting. <laughs> All due respect to uh, the Hadleys and the Chapels. But that was the uh, Aotearoa sacrificial series. Then the All Whites come in. Bang, bang, victories over the Socceroos. Aotearoa Kiwis win the World Cup with uh, victories over the Kangaroos as well. Big up to the Patreon Fano. This Prior to this episode of the Variety Show, the uh, Wildcard did do a nice breakdown of All Whites versus Socceroos. So there's a bit of football there for the Patreon Fano to enjoy, as well as just touching on the Black Caps T20 World Cup squad that was announced prior to recording. So that podcast is on the Patreon feed for the Patreon Fano. Once again, All Whites versus Socceroos preview and Black Caps T20 World Cup squad. Patreon.com forward slash EL Niche Cash. El Niche Cash for the Patreon Fano. It is the best way to support us straight up the guts. You can also get your niche cache fix via the email newsletter which we send out with uh, Substack. The, the nichecase.substack.com. Every Monday and Friday, you're getting all sorts of uh, Aotearoa sporting information as well as all the niche case links and our podcast stuff as well, delivered straight to your inbox via Substack. Wildcard, hit us up with some mindfulness. Yeah, um, just quickly, my favorite mispronunciation of niche cash that i've heard in my uh in my lifetime was definitely niche quiche which makes me hungry uh every time i think about that one um uh, gone to a book thing today and i get impressed when i pull out the book mindfulness but it normally just means that i haven't come up with anything so i grab a book and open a random page um this is from rumi persian poet way back in the day uh which one did i pick out let's go with this one um Indecision is the prison where the soul is kept captive. It even rhymes a little bit. That's a good one. Indecision. 
in all my mindfulness, it is still quite frustrating with it when you're with someone and they can't decide what to eat. They can't decide what to do. They can't decide what to wear, whatever the fuck it is. Like, as you, as your mindfulness alluded to, just make a decision, roll with it, learn and grow. And that then at least you're freeing your soul from the captive nature of indecision because it just seems so stagnant indecision, right? Yeah. Yeah, very much. Like stagnant's a good word for it. Um but when you're sitting there at the at the like cafe table waiting for someone to decide what they want, you know, you just just gotta realize their soul is being kept captive at that moment. <laughs> when they're struggling to read that menu, like that's their soul being imprisoned. Uh it's takes a little time to bust out of those things sometimes but yeah when you don't because indecision is an action and when you don't act you either just let things happen to you um and therefore you have no like agency in your life which is not a very mindful way to be um despite like it sounds a bit counterproductive when you think about like meditation is not doing anything and whatever but it's also you're not present in the moment when you're um when you're indecisive because you're too busy thinking about past uh situations future consequences you're not actually living in the moment just just you know just pick the mince and cheese pie you'll be fine <laughs> you know you like them and there's no intuition and in indecision because no. your intuition automatically leads you to a decision and then you trust your intuition and you just follow yeah. that yeah and i'm also like so here's, and here's that's part the, of what your mindfulness trains you to do as well, isn't it? Is to be able to trust your instincts and and just go with it because you can you can always react to stuff. That's pretty much like the bulk of what that kind of training is there for is to be able to react to life as it happens. But it doesn't happen if you don't make decisions. The practical mindfulness approach to this is when you're like in the food court or you're going out, you're pondering dinner. You don't have to say can you make a wrong decision like you don't have to do that you can just think in your head this geezer is trapped and then you can just kind of process that and you can just move on you don't need to you don't even need to pipe up you can just ponder how their indecision has kept them captive while car let's crack on with some aotearoa sport leading segment the big donny the microphone i was just uh when intermediate school fire alarm goes off certain assistant principals walking around with the big old thingamajig that's you right now what are you going to shout at us about i'm going to shout about well winston reed's retiring right it was announced yesterday these games against australia will be his final international games we don't know specifically about what he's going to do at club level um wouldn't suggest that the fact he's gone to like an entire year without signing two straight um transfer windows without signing with a new club would suggest it's maybe not the best sign of someone who's planning on sticking around for the next couple of years playing club level stuff but we'll see how that goes uh what we definitely know is that these games against australia will be the last time we see him in an all-white jersey and it is a bit of a bummer to know that he'll be bowing out with only you know maximum if he plays both games maximum 34 caps um now supposing he does play both games because staying fit uh, recurring matches has been a little bit of an issue for him 34 games is not a lot um a lot of injuries over the over the course of his career lack of fixtures for the all whites at times has also been a big factor in that uh not to mention a little bit of hesitance from west ham back in the day to release him maybe exaggerating a few of those injuries a little bit more so he doesn't have to travel and play for the national team that's certainly happened a few times you know it goes that's just like they layer the land. Um, but it is important also to say that Winston Rufa, who was maybe the greatest footballer Aotearoa has ever produced, this son of a bitch was a like tied golden boot in the Champions League, for God's sake, one season. Uh, we only just broke a 15-year drought of having anyone in that competition, and Rufa won his tied golden boot. And the fact that he was tied almost makes it better because he was tied with Ronald Koeman of FC Barcelona. So it's, it, kind of, it kind of only makes that even better. Um, Winston Rufa only earned 23 international caps for the All Whites. And he only earned two of them during his prime years between 1986 and 1995. Two caps in basically 10 years there. 
So like 34 caps, not so bad from that perspective. Chris Wood, meanwhile, as well, on course to break the all-time record for the All-Whites, which is 88 caps held by Ivan Vicilic. Uh, but Wood is an exception. Like what Reed and Rufa before him have done for Kiwi football, impossible to exaggerate. Um, same story, you know, with, uh, maybe even more so, I'd say, with Stephen Adams in the NBA, where, you know, he's never played for the Tall Blacks, but like, will he someday play for the Tall Play? I don't know. Like, it would be nice if he did. But regardless of whether he ever does, he's still representing this country to the absolute fullest at what he does at a domestic level. Um, and it's not all about, like, you know, what the the rugby propaganda might suggest, where, like, the All Blacks is the be-all and the end-all and everything else is just preparation for All Blacks. And it's not like that in other sports. And what you do in the international stage is important but you can still forge a massive legacy without it. And both Rufa and Reid played, what the, like I said, what they did is pretty much incomparable. And that's important. just an important note to know. That it's, it's not always what you do at the international stage that defines the entirety of a legacy. Although having said that, Rufa, Reid, both did play at World Cups. Like the only two the always ever made. Rufa was at one of them. Reid was at the other one. Rufa scored a key goal in qualifying for one of them. Reid scored a key goal in actually getting the first ever result at one of them. Uh, 90th minute stoppage time, in fact, after the 90th minute. Slovakia, 2010. Great header. Um, pretty significant moments. But yeah, the, the club level and what they achieved there, that is the foundation of their leg legendary statuses. And more importantly, the foundation of like, the inspiration that players like that leave along for the next generation that follows. I'm going to list the top three Kiwi NRL players left in NRL finals. It's top three, but there's actually four players. Sit with me here. The best player <laughs> from Aotearoa. The best player from Aotearoa left in NRL finals is Dylan Brown. From Northland, Hikarangi uh, Jr., half of the Eels, doing some fantastic things, running the footy, um, adding a bit of pizzazz and playmaking to his game, especially recently with some of the shape the Eels are throwing. And he's also a fantastic defensive half. When we think about finals footy, we're thinking about can a half, who is not the dominant kicking half, so Mitchell Moses is the dominant kicking half, Nathan Cleary is the dominant kicking half for the Panthers, for example. Eels have Dylan Brown, who they know is going to run for 100 metres every game, and he's going to miss maybe one tackle. If he's playing for Aotearoa, he won't miss any tackles, because that's what he did against Tonga, of all teams. Um, but I think Dylan Brown is the best player from Aotearoa left in NRL finals. Second spot, I've got James Fisher-Harris. From Kohu Kohu in the Hokianga region. I think his uh, junior club on his profile is Whangarei Maris, which might be a rugby union club. Um, but I've also got Jason Tamalolo tied with Fisher Harris in the second spot. Jason Tamalolo, Papakura, Odahuhu Jr. I think he went to De La Salle College as well before he moved, moving over to Townsville. They are tied in the second spot. Fisher Harris. Fantastic prop for the Penrith Panthers. We all know what he does well and how important he is to the Panthers' middle. Same goes with Jason Taumalolo. Especially uh, enjoying the progress and development of Taumalolo under Todd Payton, adding new skills to his game like passing, dummy half running as well. Like He's almost guaranteed a couple dummy half runs for the Cowboys. And I would rather deal with Brandon Smith out of dummy half than Jason Taumalolo out of dummy half, that's for sure. So I got Fisher Harris and Taumalolo tied for the second spot. Then we got Isaiah Papali'i in the in the third spot behind Dylan Brown, Fisher Harris, and Taumalolo. Isaiah Papali'i Tiata to Roosters Jr. Off like I think a lot of people overlook how awesome Papali'i is because on the other side of the field, you've got Sean Lane, who's always punching a hole through the defensive line. But Papali'i is fantastic. He was the Dally M back rower of the year last season, and everything this season is as good as last season. Of course, the Australians, they won't give Papali'i the award again, but he's as good as he was last season. Interestingly, Dylan Brown, Fisher Harris are both from Northland. 
So two out of the four best players left in NRL finals from Aotearoa are from Northland. Tamalolo, Papali'i, they're both from Auckland. Tamalolo from South Auckland. Isaiah Papali'i from West Auckland. Big up. Statistical scrumptiousness here, Wildcard. What are you going to enlighten us with? Um, I've got a time frame as my stat. And that time frame is 14 years, 9 months, 17 days. Or convert that just into days specifically, 5,404 days. That right there is how long it was between Chris Killen's last uh, Champions League appearance for Celtic in the 2007-2008 season and Marco Staminich's Champions League debut last week for FC Copenhagen against Sevilla in the, what are we now, 2022-23 season. So I said 15 years earlier, specifically 14 years, nine months, 17 days. That's how long it was between Champions League appearances. Staminich is the fifth dude from um, from Aotearoa to play in the Champions League. A lot of people think Winston Rufa was first, but Winston Rufa was not first. Actually, Kim Wright was first, who I don't believe ever actually got capped by the All-Whites. So another one of those international things. Not He never played in it. Well, I think he played like unofficial internationals, but I don't think he played like a capped game. Um, but he played in the 93-94 season. It certainly was. Um, for a team called Floriana in uh, Malta, I believe. Small Maltese club. They were the champions of Malta, got to play in the Champions League, lost to Porto in the first round, but he played both games. And his first game was actually one day, same round, same season, but one day before Winston Rufa's first game. So Winston Rufa actually second, but Winston Rufa, of course, as I said, won the golden boot that season. So <laughs> he, he, he set records in his own way. Um, other than Chris Killen, five games. Um, Kim Wright, two games. Winston Rufa, 10 games with eight goals. Only Kiwi to have scored in the Champions League. Um, only Kiwi male, of course, got to be specific because there is actually a much bigger history of Kiwi women playing in the Champions League. Not a huge history, but bigger than the men's. And yeah, the other one, Danny Hay. So Danny Hay, always coach, came on for Leeds in the year 2000, it was, in the group stage, away to Barcelona. Um, stoppage time, introduction off the bench the only champions league game he played and didn't actually last for a minute i don't know if he touched the ball or not but he's finally got someone in his all-white squad that he coaches who we can talk to about experiencing champions league uh, match days he's, uh, he's, he's had to wait a little while for that but he's finally got someone he can actually relate to um so good old marco staminich breaking a very long drought 14 years nine months 17 days for those who are unaware New Zealand A cricket team has been playing uh, four days against India A. I think they're going to play a bunch of one days coming up over the next week or so. But they played three four days against India A. They drew two of them and lost one of them, which is fine. Like it's tough for these lads to tour India. It's all about experience at this level. Only one bloke hit a century. Only one bloke scored over two hundred runs, and only one bloke hit over 24s in this three-game series for Aotearoa, and that was Northern District's batter, Joe Carter. He scored two centuries, 347 runs at an average of 69.4, 45 fours and four sixes. So Joe Carter was by far the best Aotearoa A batter against India A, and Joe Carter fairly good at domestic cricket recently in three of the last four first class seasons he's averaged over 40 so joe carter's got some form in domestic cricket over recent seasons good moments as well as some some dips and other formats but now he's here, blatantly the best batter for Aotearoa A against India A as well. So big up Joe Carter, Northern District's batter. Deep in the mangroves wild card, what do you got? Yeah, Women's National League started on the weekend. And very exciting times. Good, <laughs> pretty busy time in the footballing uh, calendar in this country. But 
watched all four of those games very much enjoyed it wrote all about it already um team of the week in the sub stack as well on top of that heaps of coverage but this is the level the women's national league often the level where you first hear about like emerging players the next generation type coming through um, particularly in the women's competition compared to the men's one like this is before they go to college in america this is before they go professionally in europe before they even play for a lot of the various age grade national teams and there was an under 20 world cup a few weeks ago several players from that squad are, are playing in the national league as it stands there is also an under 17 world cup coming up in india in about three weeks time so that squad should be named very soon what I've done here is I've just picked out a player or two from every team who is eligible for that under-17 World Cup, as far as I can tell, because uh, squad details, date of births, those kind of things. Not always the easiest details to find, but um, based on my research, here we go. Northern Rovers, going to chuck up Suya Herring, left back, who watching her at the Kate Shepard Cup final and also the game on the weekend, both against Auckland United, curiously. Under Ellie Riley vibes about the way she plays left back. And that's that's some pretty high praise. Also, um, didn't want to ignore Danny Cannon um, either, who scored the goal for Northern Rovers on the weekend, got into a number of good positions. Midfielder pushing forward into the area. Auckland United, Easy Mahi, Millie Clegg, <laughs> best prospect we've got right now in the women's game. Uh, but for some bonus points, I'll chuck in her mate, Ruby Nathan, as well, playing as an attacking midfielder. Both of them were in the under-20 squad. Both of them are eligible for the under-17 still. So that gives you uh, an indication of where they're at. Um, Western Springs are next. I'm going to go with Lara Colpe, who played the first half of their game against Southern in the midfield, moved on to the right wing for the second half. Two assists, only player in the first round who had multiple assists. Just both times really impressive, getting the ball in space, holding her with and just having the patience and the poise to to like wait long enough before whipping in that cross from the byline, giving her attackers a chance to get in front of their marker, picking out the spot, like really good composed stuff, earned those assists, love that, Lara Colpe. Eastern Suburbs, I thought about this a little bit. I'm going to go with Olivia Page, who played right wing back for them, also got an assist. Um, looks like a pretty skillful player up and down that wing there. Central United have heaps of them. <laughs> Central United are always real young, so I could go with a bunch. I'm going to go with Lara Smith, center back. Looked really solid there, actually, against Canterbury. I guess a dangerous Canterbury team, too. Like, a lot of work to do there. Um, she was she was very solid. Uh, also probably should give a shout-out to the attacking forces of Holly Kleinsman and Georgie Fennell, too, for Central. Capital... Looking at their thing, I'm not I'm not sure because I don't have the best details on Capital, but I'm not sure they had a 17-year-old or younger in their starting lineup. They did, however, have Olive Lynch Gerard coming off the bench. So there's her. Canterbury Pride, uh, Ella McCann. Ella McCann played half a game for the youth team, so the under-17s team beforehand. Only played half a game because then they put her on the bench for the senior team. Comes off the bench, sets up a goal, looks good, running around, lots of energy, fair bit of skill up front. Um, and then Southern, again, Southern have got a real consistent team from the last few years. And there isn't anyone who was like 14 years old playing three years ago who is still playing now um, in that team. So like a little bit harder to check. And I, I couldn't find anyone that I knew for certain was 17 or younger, but they do have two 18 year olds in there in their team, Abby Rankin and Amy Simmers. Amy Simmers, good, solid goalkeeper, Abby Rankin, midfielder. Both of them actually moved down from central, um, central football. So again, <laughs> central of all the clubs, central are the ones who, if you're like 15 years old and hoping to play national league, you, you probably want to go. You'll probably want to have been born in Palmerston North or, or Napier or something, because that's where you're going to get your opportunities soonest. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a nice list of prospects to keep an eye on. And at least a few of those should be in that under 17 world cup and imminently whenever that's, whenever that's named. Deep in the mangroves this morning was the first mm. game for the white ferns against West Indies. This series was meant to start on the weekend, um, but there was a bit of a, a weather mishap in the Caribbean. So that got post postponed and the first game was played this morning. White Ferns won in a very confusing finish. Apparently it was bad light and there was duck duck uh daylight no, not daylight savings. Duckworth and Lewis. There wasn't daylight savings, so they might have been able to finish the game. <laughs> Ilya Kerr could have got her fifty. Um 
that imaginary formula that they made up to decide cricket games that decided this cricket game and apparently the kiwis won which was impressive it was a that was a bummer because i think the white ferns needed 10 runs off the last 12 balls and it was going to be a pretty interesting finish with brooke halliday not out and amelia kerr not out on 47 instead uh, both teams just stopped playing and we were left to figure out what the fuck was happening Apparently, the Kiwis won, which was nice. Susie Bates hit a 51 up the top of the order. Susie Bates is in fantastic form this year and in ODI cricket. Uh, the Black Cap, uh, the White Ferns bowlers did a fairly de decent job. This game was a shortened game, 35 overs for the West Indies and then 33 overs for the, for the Black, uh, White Ferns. Um, interestingly, Fran Jonas and Amelia Kerr were de deployed as spinners and Caribbean conditions favour spin bowling. So I am interested to see what happens with the likes of Hayley Jensen, Jess Kerr, Sophie Devine, Hannah Rowe, who are all seamers who I don't know if you should have all four of them bowling in these conditions. I think the White Ferns could go all in on spin, get Eden Carson in there and um still have like sophie divine and amelia kura batting in the top three so you can still squeeze in all sorts of bowling options for the rest of these games um fran jonas took two wickets jess kerr took two wickets which was good for them i am uh it was going to be a good finish but that was kind of due to the same old white ferns issue and that issue is that no one else wants to score runs. And the White Ferns are stacking their top order. Susie Bates, Sophie Devine, Amelia Kerr. Three world-class batters, let alone world-class cricketers. Susie Bates, one of the best female cricketers in the world. Sophie Devine, one of the best female cricketers in the world as well. Over a long period of time. Sophie Devine hit 25, Amelia Kerr 47 not out. And then it just looks super fragile again and this is a thing to watch out for with the white ferns because they're all these all these like role-playing batters maddie green she did have a score 18 off 24 but that's what maddie green tends to do uh laurie lauren down Haley jensen and brooke holiday were also involved in that middle order and this has been an issue for the White Ferns for a while. And if these players aren't getting better, then that's not a good sign for the development and process and, and improving players because they're the players who have struggled for the White Ferns in their woes. Like it's the same players. They keep getting these opportunities, but this is the biggest weakness for the White Ferns, I believe. Are these role-playing batters and i think the white ferns are a very strong team if susie bates sophie divine amelia kura scoring a lot of runs it's unrealistic to expect them to score all the runs all the time and as soon as you get into that middle order as was the case in this game the opposition has a crack and they have a sniff they've got a whiff of victory and that's what happened like Haley jensen five off 11 Lauren Down, 4 off 3. Brooke Halliday, 3 off 4. Maddie Green, 18 off 24. West Indies got back in that game because of that middle order. And that is the most interesting aspects or aspect of White Ferns cricket right now. Then, spinny conditions in the Caribbean. It's all about this trio of spinners and how effective they can be. Eden Carson didn't play the first game. Hopefully she gets a bit of game time because I think that trio of spinners fran jonas amelia kerr and eden carson can be effective for the white ferns and more effective than the seamers in these conditions question time wildcard i'll give you the honor of laying out the first question well i got heaps of questions i could ask about the white ferns just off the top of that and also the maybe 20 minutes of it that i was able to catch this morning because i i was mostly trying to catch up on flying kiwi stuff but I'll, I'll leave that the broadcast was very weird was the, the main one um but i'll leave that stuff for now uh 
what I do have is a question about Joe Carter, because as you highlighted all the, the New Zealand A runs that he scored earlier, and we know that New Zealand A stuff has been treated as a direct pipeline into the Black Caps in recent times. Uh, most recently was Michael Bracewell, does some great stuff at NZA level, straight into the Black Caps next. Like the guys who dominated this are the people who they are looking at to be like the next, next cab off the rank. Do you see a pathway for Joe Carter into the Black Caps? Um, I guess test team specifically, but it doesn't necessarily have to just be test team. Do you see a, a pathway for Joe Carter in the near future into the Black Caps? I, yeah, if he scores runs, like if he scores runs this summer, he'll be a factor. I don't necessarily think the A stuff is as important in projecting what might happen for the Black Caps as you seem to do. Like, a lot of players have scored runs for A teams, a lot of players have taken wickets for A teams. And then they suck in the Plunkett Shield, they don't do anything in domestic cricket, and they fall off into the abyss. And I think while this is interesting, the most important thing is what each of these players does in the domestic summer, especially someone like uh, Tom Bruce. What did he do last summer? He hit back-to-back -back double hundies, I think, off the top of my head. Didn't do anything against India A. So... What did Tom Bruce do? 32 runs at an average of 16. Robbie O'Donnell, fantastic batsman last summer. 48 runs in, at an average of 16. Chad Bowes, Canterbury veteran. 29 runs at 14.5. Like Those lads were among the best batters in domestic cricket last summer. Didn't do anything for Aotearoa A. I don't think it's a red flag against their name because when you get back to domestic cricket, that's where... Um, all eyes will be on these batters. And if Joe Carter repeats what he's done in the last few seasons, he would still be a factor. My question to you, Wildcard, just a quick one here. What are your expectations for the New Zealand Aotearoa breakers this season? Expectations is a tricky word. <laughs> I, I think they will be better. I like the signs. I think they've made better signings um i think modi mayor has been certainly more inspiring than dan shamir was hopefully more tactically astute as well will remains to be seen but you know fingers crossed um don't know that we can be expecting a team that finished comfortable wooden spooners last year to suddenly be like pushing for finals um basketball or anything like that so it's possible because this is a league that can fluctuate quite a bit from year to year um, outside, you know, the, the couple dominant teams. I mean, we saw bloody Tas Tasmania Jack Jumpers last year in their first ever season made the finals. So th that can happen. But expectations for the breakers is just that they'll be better. Uh, there'll be better vibes. There'll be better performances. There'll be hopefully better players. Um, but I don't know if there's going to be an abundance more wins than what they had. Well, in are we the past. talking playoffs, finals, or not? I would say if they can finish sixth, would be a very good result. If they can finish top four and make the semis, then to be honest, I would say that's beyond expectations right now. I just don't think you can turn things around that quickly, that suddenly. Um, speaking of <laughs> similar things, because the Warriors season finished a couple of weeks ago, speaking of turning things around, um, I don't know where the Warriors necessarily are going to go next season. It's very hard to predict things with a new coach, but there are still some things to, to keep an eye out for and what remains of the Australian um, rugby league season, because I see that Redcliffe are in the reserve grade final. Redcliffe, of course, have been like sharing resources with the Warriors in the last couple of seasons. Um, no doubt the focus for Redcliffe will be from the Aussie media will be, you know, they're trying to get, they're going to be an NRL team next year. This is them like laying a platform, but is there like Warriors buzz? We should be taking it from that as well. Like are there players there out leading the cause and whatnot? There probably will be in reserve grade. Like I think Rocco Berry played last week and we've got the guys like Pride Pedersen Robati from Wellington, Jackson Free, Frey, those type of dudes might play. Um, but Warriors fans should be tuned into the Redcliffe Under-21s. And mm -hmm. 
both these teams are in the grand final. So what you're going to hear are the Australians talking up Redcliffe's development system because the under-21s are in the grand final, which is great for Redcliffe. However, half that team are Warriors juniors. And half that half the Redcliffe under-21s team who are Warriors juniors, most of them are also under-19, under-20s. And they're playing in an Australian Queensland under-21s competition and they're in the grand final. That seems like good junior development, right? Like that seems like a decent crop of junior talent. And Reevecliffe under 21s is what Warriors fans need to be paying the most attention to. Fuck Reevecliffe. Kind of screw the reserve grade team. Who cares about New South Wales Cup signings for next season? Reevecliffe under 21s this week. Team will be announced, named Tuesday evening. Won't know until the weekend who exactly is playing. But this is probably one of the most important Warriors things you need to know right now heading into the summer. Musical Jam Wildcard just want to shout out Green T. Ping. She's got a new project called Green Zone 108. And this is fantastic uh, spiritual guidance. Beautiful music, funky music, bit of a reggae roots london accent -y vibe which is all funk but it's the spiritual guidance of green tea ping the music grounds you offers solutions to your problems and it's a beautiful um, project green tea ping green zone 108 your musical jam wildcard yeah i got a few written on my list here but just looking at the list all i really want to say is listen to the new marlon williams album which came out last week Listen to the new Beth's album that came out last Friday or whatever, um, one week later. They're both fantastic. Um, they're both like, or the, I think the Beth's thing is definitely an improvement on their second album. Um, maybe not quite as good as their first album, which I absolutely adore, but um, extremely good. Like it's another step up from a really solid Kiwi band. And Marlon Williams is hard to it's just hard to compare what he's doing here to what he's done in his first two albums because a um, little bit of a different as whereas whereas the Beths are very like consistent in their sound and what they're trying to do. Marlon Williams has just gone different directions each time with his uh, solo releases, but both those albums absolutely fantastic. Um, I'll tell you, music like what what more do you want? Um, top level sounds, man is there's nothing there's nothing else i really like i'm just ignoring everything else like on the list to say go listen to those two albums big up our music best music in the world best sporting nation in the world big up to all the people in our big up to all the people around the world who apparently give a shit about our as well you're nice we like you just shout out to the land of our and all the uh the water and the the water that surrounds it but also i'm fascinated by the creatures that uh float above it the birds and the uh the butterflies and the spirits and everything glorious about aotearoa how good's aotearoa music i mean very good <laughs> some absolute like killer albums the last couple of years in particular that just seems like i don't know if things were hitting on such a level but then of course there is a long legacy so I'm probably speaking out of turn there Big up to yourself. Love yourself. Kia kaha. Stay beautiful. We'll be back with another podcast on Thursday. Thanish-cash.com. Chir-chir.